Proposals have been recently made to increase the number of Supreme Court justices. How would court packing reflect and affect the rule of law itself? What I'm trying to do is to make those whose initial instincts may favor important structural change or other similar institutional changes, such as forms of court packing, think long and hard before they embody those changes in law. That's Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer last week at his alma mater, Harvard University. In a nearly two-hour lecture, Breyer, who is considered one of the three remaining liberals on the bench, warned that measures to expand the court size would make the institution look political and erode trust that the judiciary has built up with the American people. Breyer is also the court's oldest current serving justice. He's 82 years old and in his 27th year on the highest court in the land. And he's facing increasing calls from liberals to retire while a Democrat in the White House and a Democratic-led Senate can choose his successor. Breyer didn't address those calls in his recent speech, nor did he acknowledge how politicized the court has already been in recent years. As Donald Trump especially, especially added to that politicization by adding three conservative judges to the highest bench in the most cynical and partisan of ways. It began in February 2016 when Justice Antonin Scalia died and Senate Republicans, led by Mitch McConnell, spent a year blocking a vote on Barack Obama's nominee, Merrick Garland. The following April, they ran through Donald Trump's choice for a justice, Neil Gorsuch. The, politi the politicizing, excuse me, of the court continued in 2018 when Justice Anthony Kennedy retired and Republicans installed this man to replace him as one of the most influential jurists on planet Earth. I drank beer with my friends. Almost everyone did. Sometimes I had too many beers. Sometimes others did. I liked beer. I still like beer. Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh, ladies and gentlemen. And the court's politicization reached its apex last year when Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died less than two months before the November 2020 election. Rather than observe the precedent they had set, Blocking the Merrick Garland nomination in election year, Republicans rubber-stamped Trump's nomination of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court in rapid time, a move that almost two-thirds of Americans, including half of Republicans, initially said they opposed. Given this unprecedented packing of the court with GOP-friendly ideologues, many liberals say the only hope of enacting progressive reform, democratic reform in America, is to expand the court beyond its current size of nine justices, a number that hasn't changed since 1869, but did change on multiple occasions before then. And Joe Biden is listening, sort of. As he promised on the campaign trail, Biden announced last week that he would create a bipartisan commission of experts to study the future of the court and make proposals on how many justices there should be on, whether we should have term limits. The commission has six months to issue its findings. But does picking a blue ribbon panel really change anything? One man who might be uniquely qualified to answer that question is Aaron Belkin, director of Take Back the Court Action Fund. Belkin runs the California-based Palm Center, a think tank devoted to improving the quality of public dialogue about controversial public policy issues. Uh, while there, he designed and implemented much of the public education campaign responsible for helping end the military's don't ask, don't tell policy in 2011. And Aaron Belkin of Take Back the Court joins me now. He's also the author of How We Won, Progressive Lessons from the Repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Aaron, thanks so much for coming on the show. Um, Mark Joseph Stern, a legal reporter for Slate magazine, he makes the case that the Biden uh, Supreme Court Commission is just kicking the can down the road uh, when they might lose control of the government next year, of the Senate. Uh, Mark adds that the commission will tell Biden what he already knows, that it's totally legal to pack the court and it's just a political decision. So is this commission worse than doing nothing? You know, when I started Take Back the Court two and a half years ago, uh, there was literally no support for the idea anywhere in the country. And fast forwarding to today, if you had told me two and a half years ago that the White House was going to take the threat of the broken court seriously enough to appoint a commission, I would say that that is evidence that the issue is moving forward. But at the same time, as you so rightly note, there is not that much time on the clock for Democrats to make change. We need action, not study. And what needs to happen now is that Congress needs to introduce legislation to expand the court. Yes, uh, I'm glad you mentioned legislation and also the timing. I mean, 
Democrats could lose control of the Senate tomorrow morning if an elderly member of the Senate, God forbid, were to pass away. The idea that you even have till next November uh, is very optimistic. So how do you get Joe Biden? How do you get a majority of Democratic senators and a majority of uh, the House, uh, a majority of Americans on board with this project, which, as you say, it only requires uh, an act of Congress. It doesn't require a constitutional amendment. But how do you get people on board with an idea that is seen as radical, even if it's not radical? I believe uh, four presidents, uh, five presidents managed to pull it off. How do you get people on board? You're the expert on changing hearts and minds. How do you do it? Yeah, and when I joined the campaigns that eventually culminated in the ending of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and later the ending of the military's transgender ban, uh, people said that those were hard and, and, and they were right. But but we can do this. Progressives can do this. And we've won before and we'll win again. Um, look, the, the politics of judicial reform are shifting very fast. When we started, there was no support. Today, there are leaders in Congress who support court expansion. There are more than 50 organizations calling yes. for court expansion. And you're right. Joe Biden is not there today. But what's it going to look like when the court continues to strike down Roe v. Wade? What's it going to look like if Congress passes H.R. 1 so that black and brown people can vote? And then John Roberts comes and he curtails or destroys the bill. Every time the court hurts everyday Americans, which it does on a regular basis, there will be growing recognition that something has to be done <laughs> as the appointment of the commission shows. So... So you say something has to be done, Aaron. You've suggested adding four justices, I believe, uh, to the court. Why four? What's so important about that number? Because I've heard some people say add two. Some people say make it even bigger, make it 20 plus, like some foreign countries have as their Supreme Court numbers. What number? What's the magic number? What's the right number for expanding? Democracy is hanging by a thread. And we need a court that is going to protect democracy, that is not going to enable voter suppression and flooding the system with dark money and hyperpartisan gerrymandering and to get a court that will do all that, to get a court that will allow Congress and the administration to fix gun violence and the broken immigration system and climate, all those issues, yeah. we need at least four more justices Understood. and that would rebalance the court. But why four? Because that's the number that uh, would deliver a, uh, a court that would allow Congress and the administration to get the job done. So a Republican listening to you speak there will say, see, it's brazenly political. You're just choosing a number that will give liberals slash Democrats a majority on the court. Once we get the White House back, once we get Congress back, we'll just add four Republicans and take back control again. What's to stop that arms race in terms of, you know, that's the classic argument, isn't it, against expansion, which is you do it, then we'll do it, and it's never ending. Yeah, I would say three things about that. So first of all, the court has already been stolen. And if your wallet is stolen, you don't forego efforts to recover it just because it might get stolen again. So that's the first thing. Second of all, even if Democrats do nothing, nothing at all, we know that the Republicans will pack the court if they ever need to do so to control it. How do we know that? Because they've been packing state courts throughout the country for the last 10 years. They yes. got away with- Good point. Yes. And then the third thing is that counterintuitively, Expanding the court is the safest way to depoliticize the court, to protect the court from this kind of partisan jockeying. Why is that? Because court expansion is not about the court. It's about democracy. And what needs to be done is we need to pass H.R. 1 and then protect H.R. 1 from the stolen court. If you pass H.R. 1, that arguably will unrig the system and give the Republican Party an incentive to de-radicalize at least somewhat if they have to play in a fair system. And it's a de-radicalized Republican Party yeah. that is least likely to try to steal the court again. Now I know why you're so good at these messaging campaigns. I do like that, the way you phrased it a moment ago, that we need to expand the court to take politics out of the court. Sounds uh, so appealing uh, and convincing. One last quick question before we run out of time. We focus a lot on the Supreme Court, but Trump appointed more than 200 federal judges to circuit and appeals courts. Hard to forget Mitch McConnell gloating about that. Uh, have a listen to him in 2019 saying... Barack Obama did 55 circuit judges in eight years. We've done 50 in three years. Remember, most cases don't make it to the Supreme Court. 
Most complex litigation never makes it beyond, beyond the circuit courts. I was shocked that uh, former President Obama left so many vacancies and didn't try to fill those positions. I'll Senator, tell you why. I'll tell you why. I was in charge of the... Uh, of what we did the last two years of the Obama administration. I give, I, and I will give you full credit for that. And by the way, take a bow. M McConnell bragging aside, uh, Aaron, 30 seconds, what, 30 seconds left. Do, de do Democrats spend too much time not focused on the courts? Do they need to spend more time looking at those lower courts? Democracy is hanging by the thread. We are not going to be able to restore democracy unless the Supreme Court is expanded and lower federal courts are expanded, too. You're absolutely right. Right. The Republicans stole more than 100 lower uh, court vacancies from President Obama. Those have to be replaced with judges who will read the law in a fair way. And yes, both the Supreme Court and lower federal courts must be expanded. Expand both to save democracy. Well put. Uh, my thanks to Aaron Belkin. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen. And make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.